uh, hi everybody, I'm really pleased to be here to uh, speak about monetization of legacy PHP applications using Symfony 2. So it's a subject I've come to be um, quite knowledgeable about because I've been working on that for now almost two years. And I'll try to present you the technical challenges, the solutions we found, and also uh, I think it's quite important all the uh, business uh, side of uh, of why uh, it's interesting to me and why it's interesting to do it the way I will talk about. Oh yeah, and a uh, little disclaimer, I'm really sorry about my English. I used to have a really simple French accent, quite easy to understand, and I've, I'm lucky to be dating with a British girl for the last few months. <laughs> so I started having this really nice uh, British accent, and now I've been here for a week and I'm completely confused between accents, so I'm going to do a mix of French and whatever. Anyway, okay, let me first briefly introduce myself. My name is Fabrice Bernard, and I'm the uh, CTO and co-founder of uh, Anomatch.com, a website, and Teodo, an IT consulting company. So I'm mentioning the fact that I'm working on these two companies uh, because it's quite interesting. They're quite different. Anomatch.com is, is a website. Um, means that... Uh, We've been maintaining a code base for the lab for the past six years now. Very interesting as the C hear me actually? Ah, that's not good. How come? It's a fault of the sweatshirt. Working? Yeah, it seems so. Okay, perfect. So, anomatch.com, it's the websites for sports and bars. So, imagine you're going to Paris next year for Symphony Life Paris, and you want to watch a really important game of Portland. What's the name? Portland Beavers? Or something like that? So, anyway, you're in Paris, you want to see the game, you don't know where to watch it, you can go on anomatch.com, and it's going to list you all the venues, bars, restaurants, pubs that will show the game, and so you will be able to see your game. And Teodo is an IT consulting company, so specialized in Symphony 2. I'm proud to say, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but almost sure, that after Sensio Labs, we're the leading company in the world in terms of certified Symphony 2 developers. We have three. <laughs> <laughs> that makes us the leading. I think it's. Okay, perfect. Anyway. Uh, so oh, yeah, I already put the um, microphone thing. The uh, join link in case you do real-time feedback and a picture of the what part of the team that was like Symphony Life Berlin. <laughs> so uh, first, the business side, because I think they're really important, especially when you have to uh, try to convince somebody to do a progressive rewrite. Um, so the context, which makes this uh, subject that interesting. <laughs> a bit of both. I thought they were like counteracting, but anyway. So the, the, this, I think the, um, the question of modernizing PHP apps is really important because there are many, many legacy PHP applications everywhere. And one of the good reasons is that PHP is really the leading language on the web, so 79% of the top 1 billion websites according to W3Techs. Now the bad news is PHP has been created in 94, and it's not before 2004 actually that the fifth version came out, which was considered as the first one really implementing uh, OOP patterns. So it's not until 2004 that people started really trying to organize their code more in an OOP way. And it's not before 2007, actually, and the release of Zen Framework 1 and Symphony 1, that people actually started uh, also adopting massively the MVC uh, architecture. So if you do the math, it makes 13 years of mostly spaghetti-coded websites. So um, that makes it lots of them. And I'm certain that you have come 
to work on one of these apps, or maybe will in the near future, and, uh, and you're really dreading it because it's horrible to work on such apps. Now, that's from the technical point of view, but there's actually also a business reason why it's, it's, all these apps are really bad. And the reason is quite simple. It's because we, have, we are now in a digital age, which means that uh, it's, not, it's really important that the, the, the key factor for uh, succeeding is velocity. So this, as this book uh, clearly shows it, it's not the big that eat the small anymore among like, competing companies. It's usually, especially on the internet, the fast that eat the slow. And the problem is with like a, a spaghetti code base, you know that you're gonna be slow to react, to make it evolve, and you will break things all the time, and that's, that really is a, a business issue. So, you, if you want to like stay above your competitors, you clearly have to somehow improve your code base, and you've got two solutions for that. The first one, usually the one preferred by technical teams, is to just trash everything and start again. And, and the second one would be actually to try to uh, rewrite it in a progressive way. Um, my point is that starting from scratch after trashing everything is really tempting, especially because you've got all these psychological issues of not wanting to touch it anymore and everything. But there are many problems and it's really dangerous for the business. So the first obvious reason is that you need two, twice more developers because there's one team staying to maintain the old app and there's the new team trying to rewrite it. This is like what I typically see in a lot of companies. And, but the, the main, I would say the most problematic reason is that you're actually being completely anti-agile. So you're doing new developments that stay invisible until the new version is finally, uh, has finally reached the same functionality level as the old one. So that's, that can be months without putting your app in production. And this is completely the opposite of being agile. So what the two consequences are, there's a functional risk of, um, of you know, of this whole time not being able to deliver the functionalities you would have wanted to deliver to your clients. In the case of a rewrite, there's another functional risk, which is quite interesting, is that usually you see the spaghetti code base, you think, oh, people in that time, they were stupid. But actually, they, they weren't, there are reasons why they did that. It's usually because they were just piling new business, um, new business needs on new business needs. So maybe they didn't, they lacked the big picture, so they just piled them up and up. But there's a lot of intelligence usually hidden in spaghetti code bases. And when you rewrite them, you, I mean, the chances of forgetting features is really high. And then of course there's the technical uh, risk, uh, which is simple. When you put a completely new app in production, you change so many things at the same time that the probability of having problems is, uh, yeah, 100%. Huh? Now, this interesting thing is that often when I mention these points to people, they often say, yeah, but I'm aware of the risks. Don't worry, we'll test it for months. Now, the interesting thing is that it's actually more dangerous than you think. And this, is, uh, based, this, uh, this idea is based on a study that was made by two Oxford professors on a really like a huge number of IT projects. And they found out like things we already know that usually IT projects end up costing more than expected. Now the number is quite amazing. It's one out of six ends up costing three times more. So it's not 30% more, it's really three times. And the other aspect which is quite interesting is that they, even if pe people think they're aware of the risks, they actually measured that it would, the, 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 the projects were 20 times more likely to spiral out of control than what I was expected in the beginning. So this is what they called uh, the black swan blindness, which I will explain just afterwards. And just to show you how this can impact even like really huge projects and have amazing consequences, two really huge examples. So the first one is uh, Levi's. So basically they had this really fast growth quite chaotic and had a lot of different IT systems. They tried to merge all of them, so it was a really huge project, many years and everything, uh, migrating everything to SAP. I think they were working with Anderson or Accenture, whatever. Anyway, so of course it was like a, a many, many hundred millions uh, dollar project, and even if they had, they thought they had tested everything, the day they put it in production, they had like, 
two weeks of logistic problems and lost, and they considered that this added $200 million losses to the overall cost of the project, which was already above $600 million or something. Now, the even better example, so I'm not American, so I never heard about Fox Mayer drugs before. I don't know if you had. Apparently, it used to be the fourth biggest pharmaceutical company in 94, I think. And they were really keen. Their business model was mainly on like huge quantities, small margins, and they wanted to migrate to SAP. So once again, big projects, made like three, four years, they tested it and retested it. And the day they put it in production, they had such a huge log logistic problem that they actually lost so much money, they went, they filed for bankruptcy, I think one or two years afterwards. So <clears throat> I don't think these people would do a total rewrite again if they had the choice. Now the uh, black swan blindness effect is quite interesting, so I'm just going a little bit back to it. It's the idea that it's, uh, um, it refers to the book The Black Swan. I don't know if you've read it, but it's, it's about the, why the financial crisis happened and what happens in our brains. So the idea is quite simple, is that we, we've been through evolution. Um, uh, we've come to learn that things happen in a bell curve way, because that's what we see as, you know, very historic uh, uh, humans, we only see natural phenomena, and usually, you know, if you take the height of a, of a mammoth attacking you, it's usually around the bell curve. So there are like big mammoths and small mammoths, but nothing like that can really like be twice the size. So usually when we, see, and, and we see the whole world through this prism. So we usually, when we see something that we consider average, we say, okay, that's the good case scenario and that's the worst case scenario. And it, it can't be much worse than that. And the thing is, when you look at complex systems, so it can be like, of course, like a financial system or a large IT project, it's not a bell curve anymore. It looks more like that, which means that what you thought was the worst case scenario ends up being a really likely scenario. And the worst case is way more to the left. And <clears throat> so the solution to that, if you don't want to uh, file for bankruptcy in the short term, um, is to try to, of course, um, work in the small chunks, small iterations, and that's of course what all agile methods are about. So you've got lean startup, which is you have to be iterate in a really short, uh, short iterations with your, with your customers. And on a technical level, I would say this is really what DevOps is all about. I don't know if you've heard about DevOps. Really interesting movement, which is all about how can I deploy as often as possible in production. Okay, we're soon coming to the technical aspects. Um, anyway, so this is the uh, summary slide that you can you know, copy paste and put in whatever business uh, slides you want. Um, so basically, if you consider a rewrite, so you, <laughs> I've got a laser in that, great. So this is like the functionalities over time. So you've had like constant functionalities for quite some time because it's a legacy app. And so you've, you find it hard to make it better. And you decide to rewrite it from scratch at some point in time, and you hope it will look like that. So the truth is, it usually looks a lot more like that because you completely underestimated all the business logic that was behind the project. And you get this horrible tunnel effect, which is completely non agile no. And what I want to... Um, try to convince you is that you should have a much more progressive approach, which from the beginning on, you see will be maybe a little slower, but at least you will have things in production right away and less risks, which is an unbeatable time to market. Okay, so now why, um, if progressive rewrite is the way to go, why wouldn't a technical team actually suggest it? Um, I would say one of the main reasons is because it's really challenging. So you, of course you've got the, uh, the fact that you have to work with, really hard, with uh, code that is really hard to read. And it's also because you're really touching at everything that concerns an application. You're touching the ugly source code, but you also like, you have to like, um, uh, work on the system, upgrading the system. You have to take the cache systems into account. You have to look at all the remote web services that can be actually 
uh, connected to your app, and there's the data. You, like, if you want to change the model, that's going to be a really hard subject. What I find really interesting is that from a conceptual level, the big picture is basically you're trying to take your app and decouple some parts of it and try to take them out and rewrite them. And basically, it's the same kind of technical challenges that you face when you're trying to scale and trying to decouple some parts of your apps and put them on different servers. So, and we will see some of these solutions actually sometimes look, look quite like. <clears throat> okay, so progressive rewrite is hard, but I think it's completely worth it. It's, it's, uh, and you should never do a total rewrite because that's way too dangerous. So now let's look at the technical side of that um, when you're trying to rewrite PHP and to Symfony 2. Um, so basically, uh, I think we can do that in seven steps. So first one will be trying to find ways to prevent regressions. Then we'll need to upgrade the system in like um, most cases. And then we'll try to start doing new developments in Symfony 2 integrated with the uh, legacy app. And for that, we'll need to plug into the routing, try to integrate into the current layout, share the session. And once we're done with that, then we'll try to rewrite some parts of the legacy app by decoupling the code and trying to migrate the model. So first, preventing regressions. Um, so this is a really important aspect because you want to modify legacy code and you'd like not to break everything. So basically that's a quite tough challenge. So you will need belt and straps and, and still that will be most certainly not enough. I'm happy I managed to put like a sexy picture to illustrate this really technical topic. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so the first thing to do is usually legacy applications don't have any tests. I mean, if you have some, you're lucky. Um, and by definition, when you look at the legacy app, which has not been well architectured, it's, uh, it's deeply coupled. So it means that touching one part will break something in the completely other end of the application, so something you didn't even think about. So you need testing, and since you do not have time most of the time to like test the whole application, you will do the thing you should do is at least like function test the most critical scenarios. Just to give you like a um, <clears throat> just an idea of the number of tests one can make, Etsy is a really good, interesting example. They're in PHP. And they communicate a lot about how they work, and they say they have like what well, they said in 2011 that they had more than 7,000 tests. So that's that's quite a lot. But you know, at the start with a few tests that really like are on the most critical parts, which are, for example, buying and paying and things like that. For that, I recommend using um, uh, the uh, the Behab, uh, project, um, especially the Ming driver. The Ming driver enables you to make functional tests that you will be able to connect then on different, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, and to different uh, solutions. It could can be good. So just testing on the HTTP, HTTP level it can be uh, Zombie Zombie JS. So you're testing in a headless WebKit, or it can be a Selenium. So you're really testing in different browsers using the same, the same code. <clears throat> now, the, when you have such a big app and you don't want to write 7,000 tests uh, 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 at the beginning, then the I mean, pragmatic strategy is actually to uh, test by putting small chunks in production. So the really important thing to uh, remember on that part is that you have to monitor production really well. So you need to make it sure that you clean the logs. If you have lots of 500 errors appearing for no reason, first solve that, try to remove them, try to monitor them. And, and if you don't want to be too technical about it, then you can use uh, outside services. Pingdom, for example, that checks you the you know, simple status code check. And you've got a really nice uh, portent-based company called New Relic. And you just install it, it's a, it's a Debian package on your app on your server, <coughs> and it does server monitoring, but it also does like a uh, app level monitoring. Quite really interesting. It might be a bit expensive, but I think it's worth it. Um, one important thing, this is not really technical, but um, 
it's, it's important to actually make the, everybody in the organization aware of the heightened risks. For example, if you work in an intranet, just you know, communicate about the fact that there might be some regressions and that you just want to be uh, um, contacted really quickly about them. Um, well, I had an example where there was a regression and it was corrected two weeks afterwards because there was a really strange process that went through a person that was collecting the feedback and this person was on holidays. So they had to wait two weeks. This is, this is a bit sad. And a really interesting idea also that I, found, that I saw implemented in a really big media company in France is to monitor as many business metrics as you can. For that, Etsy, once again, they created a, a small tool called StatsD that you can just push. It's a really quickly, quite, really performant. You push data to it, and then you can you know, just graph them on the dashboard using Graphite. So what they did in this uh, media company, they just, the technical team started pushing a lot of metrics inside, didn't, care really, uh, didn't really care about them, but they just showed the dashboard to like, uh, the whole company, and they realized one month afterwards that actually the marketing team was using these dashboards and checking them every morning for their own metrics, and that really gave them high-level monitoring for free, and just to give you an example, once they touched like a legacy app, and they made something that broke something about the um, uh, search engine optimization. So basically, the uh, website started being ranked worse and worse in Google, which was really hard to test in a functional way or in a unit way, even less. But thanks to these uh, dashboards, the marketing team actually realized that and said, oh, come on, we have less turnover on these pages. There must be a reason. And that's how they were able to react really quickly. So quite, quite an interesting thing to do. And of course, as I told you in the beginning, uh, the idea is to put really small chunks in production to be able to, every time there's a problem, one, to know where the problem comes from, and two, uh, to be able to roll back if there's a, an issue. So for that, you need to do a, a good deployment pipeline. This is really, in my opinion, one of the first things to do. And you need, to, you need to make a pipeline that enables you to deploy 10 times a day. And that's, that's what you should aim for, not, not something that enables you to deploy once a week. Um, yeah, and it needs to be really fast, because one of the cases you can have is you deploy a bug, and you see right away the solution, so, and it would be really sad not to just deploy the solution, uh, and instead to have to roll back, correct, and redeploy. So if the deployment system is fast enough, you can just deploy the correction directly. I personally use Fabric as a deployment tool uh, because it's quite easy and it's really it's really versatile. You can really like since it's simply um, executing commands either locally or on the server, you know when. When it's local, it's done on your computer. When it's run, it's done on the server. So it's quite easy and it enables you to do whatever scenario you want to do, especially on a legacy app um, where Capifoni might not be the most appropriate thing. Okay, so now, first step, you're a bit reassured about the fact that if you touch something, you will be made aware of and you will be able to react quickly. So now the thing is, since we're talking about migrating to Symfony 2, you most certainly will have to upgrade the system. Because Symfony 2 requires PHP 5.33. I checked it again yesterday, it's still, still that. And, um, and usually, yeah, if your app has been on the same server for a long time, that's not the version you will have. Um, so to check what is missing, there's a small script that you might not really know about check, so you just run it on the server and it tells you what is missing and you know what to do. If the, what I've seen most of the time is that people start uh, doing like uh, unhappy grimaces when you talk about migrating the server because they know it's like a really risky operation. So you have to um, back it up with some other reason than just installing Symfony 2. So one of the reasons is uh, you can use this performance. So I'm just going to I mean, I've seen going from 5.2 to 5.3, personally, there was like a 20% performance increase. And going from a, an old server to a new server is usually the same price, and once again, like 20% performance increase for free. 
So that makes it a good reason. If you want to, so yeah, next step is, uh, of course, okay, you're upgrading for Symfony 2, which is nice, but the uh, legacy app might not be able to actually support the, um, the new PHP version. So for that, there's a quite simple um, code sniffing, code sniff, that enables you to directly identify the deprecated functions, the ones that will make problems, I issue warnings, or maybe just errors. So it's quite easy, usually you, you know, identify a few functions and it's a matter of a few hours to correct the legacy app. So it makes it really, we're using it all the time, it's, it's really practical. Um, of course you need to set up a pre-production environment, I hope I'm not like teaching you anything about that. Run your functional tests on it, because of course, remember in the first step you created functional tests. And um, an interesting aspect, of course, is this, this new environment that you're setting it up, at least do it in the new cool way. I mean, provision it so that you can reproduce it at will using tools like Puppet or Chef. And you can check if you want to um, create Puppet manifests, you can check Blueprint. Blue the idea of Blueprint is basically you run it on a server and it, cr it reverse engineers what has been installed on it and creates you like Puppet manifests. So they're not really beautiful, but you know, it's a start. Okay, so now we're ready to develop uh, new functionalities using Symfony 2 next to the legacy app. So for that, the first part is uh, plugging into the routing. So, um, so basically what you want to do is be able, when a request arrives, to um, identify if this request concerns something you haven't migrated yet or something that you migrated in the meantime. And the interesting thing is usually uh, with legacy apps, you sometimes have comp no, not even any routing. So what do you do in that case? So I ended, like, yeah, in my experience, we used three different strategies. There might be more, but these are the three ones we used. So the first one, the easiest one, is basically make clear differences in the URL system and proxy between the old and the new at the server level. So it can be like a subdomain or a subfolder. Uh, so that you can use locate in Apache for that, okay, location. So usually when I um, talk about this strategy to, um, if it's a public website, nobody likes this idea of changing the subdomain, even though I've seen it in some websites, big websites. So strategy two, which is quite good, it, uh, it impacts a little the performance, but not much, is trying to do a cultural route within Symfony 2. So basically what you do is you redirect every request to Symfony 2. If Symfony 2 identifies it as, the, as a Symfony 2 route, then it handles it. And if it doesn't, like if it's not found, then you just redirect it to the old app. And the third strategy I've seen, quite interesting, works with Apache, is to use the um, Symfony 2 Apache router. So basically you do the routing in Symfony 2, you dump it in, uh, to create Apache rules, and then you copy paste these rules inside your htaccess file before the, uh, the routing of the old app. So basically, Apache handles the whole routing recognition. If it's, if it's Symfony 2, then it redirects it to the app.php file. If, if not, then it redirects it to whatever it was used to do. So some code examples. This is, for example, this is a simple example. This is a, so imagine you have like a controller that handles all the routes that contain a .php inside. And, <coughs> and he just includes uh, the file, uh, buffers it and redirects it and returns it as a response. Um, so it doesn't work that magically, so you will need to like replace exits and dies and things like that, but it's more for the example. Um, a more... Uh, a more production ready one. So this is a code that is done on the, um, that listens on the kernel request. Basically it, uh, it catches a not found HTTP exception. So if it, so either it worked and Symfony 2 handled the whole thing or it, um, there was a not found HTTP exception and in that case then you uh, start the, the um, 
legacy routing. In that case, in this example, the legacy routing is actually Drupal 8. <laughs> so we are um, redirecting to Drupal 8 when Symfony 2 hasn't found the, uh, the root. Um, so this is um, some proof of concept. It's actually online, open source. So you can check it uh, and, and you inspire yourself from the code. So it's uh, the uh, Theodo Drupal bundle. And the code I just showed you is from the uh, Drupal router listener file. So basically what is this proof of concept doing? It's, um, it's wrapping Drupal 8 inside Symfony 2. Um, so it's been open source since yesterday. And the good news is I haven't tweeted about it yet. So I added a slide to remind me that you should tweet about it. So let me check if that's ready yet. <laughs> can I, can I can move it, perfect. Great. Done. Uh, so yeah, and you can of course retweet the tweet. It's like a, I'm trying to be interactive. <laughs> okay, so now what have we done? Just to remind you of the first steps. So we prevented the regressions, and so now we are ready to change things. We upgraded the system so we could install Symfony 2, and now we plugged ourselves into the routing so that we can, so that when we create new modules in Symfony 2, they actually get caught and start the whole Symfony 2 um, stack and return the response. Another thing is, nice, you're able to do like new modules in Symfony 2, but they really don't look the same way. And the interesting thing is that for end users, doing a progressive rewrite is usually uh, synonymous with using the same templates. Because if it looks the same, it must be the same, right? So um, copy-pasting is not the solution. I've done it in the past, I confess. But the thing is, usually what you're copy-pasting are footers and menus, so header, footer. And they're usually all these parts that change quite often. And you always forget to change them. And uh, you end up having, you know, on one part of the website, the menu is like, has this and this set menus, and then the other part of the website, it's missing one. And nobody understands why. So the solution which we, we tried, and we were quite happy with it, was actually to um, identify a quick, you know, fast page on the legacy uh, application, for example, 404 page, and crawl it and include it uh, as ESIs inside the new uh, layout of the Symfony 2 app. So this is what it looks like in the you know, example way. Um, so basically here you have uh, the um, <laughs> a sub request made to legacy layout top and here a sub, sub request done to uh, legacy layout bottom. And these uh, controllers, what do they do? They uh, initiate a client to uh, request, the, for example, your legacy 404 page, and they use like simpler regular expression to just extract the header and return it. And since you're doing it as an ESI sub-request, so basically ESI, I don't know if you know that, it's like an iframe. It's a flat iframe. It's like it's a it's like an iframe, but you put a varnish in, in the front and it flattens it. And since you're using like a reverse proxy like varnish, you actually can cache it and you can have like good performances, even though the strategy doesn't look that great from a performance point of view at, the, at first sight. Um, migrating the UX and the layout in general is really not a detail. I'm uh, insisting on that. Um, because uh, because I've seen an example, I can't talk about it because it's insider information, but it's a big website in France, and they made a huge dollar rewrite, and um, and the CEO said, once again I won't say who, but he said he would ne never do that again. It was one of his worst mistakes. So now the really simple way to understand why it was a mistake when they put the new Symphony 2 version, really nice. A great architecture, completely new design. Everybody was happy with it. They put it into production. They lost 30% of their daily turnover 
on the next day. And now they were able to, um, I think, somehow stabilize around 10% less. So this is amazing, this is really amazing. So just imagine, they have this really crappy website online. They spend one year of development with a team of, I don't know, five or six, eight developers. And when they put online this really new shiny website, they lose 30% of the turnover. And of course, what do you do? Because you don't know where it comes from. Does it, is it a performance issue? Is it a, a, a UX issue? Is it, uh, it's really hard to tell because you change everything at the same time. So this is really yet another example of uh, really uh, choosing progressive rewrite instead of total rewrite. And I love the uh, Amazon argument. It works quite a lot every time somebody tells you something, you say, no, Amazon doesn't, does it differently. And usually people stop arguing. So yeah, when, on this argument, it's easy. Amazon does not make big UX changes. I hope this is a good argument for doing like, of course you, you, you can do um, design changes, but do it in like progressive way, small chunks at, uh, at a time. And you can test and check if the turnover is going up or down. <clears throat> so, now we were able to develop new modules in Symfony 2 that look like they're completely integrated with the old app because they share the same layout. So now if there's actually a session, uh, you need to share it with the legacy app. So you, we're talking about um, PHP. So basically if you, if you use the same um, uh, session system, it's quite simple to access this, the same session from the two different apps if you host them on the same computer, for example. The same computer, same server. Now the uh, tricky part if you want to access a legacy session from Symfony 2 is that Symfony 2 handles it in a really clean way inside a, uh, an arrays that are themselves stored in uh, SF2 attributes namespace. Usually that's not what your legacy session looks like. So two issues you will have to uh, face. First, you will have to register bags for every one of the arrays that are stored in your session keys. And if you don't have arrays, which happens, then you need to create a new type that doesn't exist by default in Symfony 2, which is a scalar bag. That will enable you to, well, that's the way we called it, huh? uh, that enables you to actually access values that are not arrays. So for example, if you want to access a Symfony 1 session from within Symfony 2, the code would look somehow like that. So we're basically registering the uh, SF user namespaces as new attribute bags, and they will be available in the Symfony 2 session. So much better than an example, you actually have an open source version of that. Great. So it's called Teodo Evolution Session Bundle, and you can grab it there. And um, the previous code I gave you is a kind of a mix between two different classes. So um, the bag manager and the, uh, uh, the guys that worked on the bundle, they wanted to do it really nicely. So there's a generic bag manager interface, and then there's a, specific, uh, a Symfony 1 specific version of that. And concerning the scanner bag, which I've been asked about before about, you can find it in the scanner bag file. Easy. <clears throat> okay. So we were able to, um, so now basically what we've done is we're able to do new developments in Symfony 2, completely integrated from the session point of view and layout point of view with the legacy app. But for, moment, for the moment, we're just talking about evolutions. So that's already quite good because we're able to do new evolutions in a, on a really nice, on a really good framework, good architecture, quite reassuring for the future. But now, what, what if we want to change existing things? So that's what I call attacking the spaghetti problem. So um, the idea is, okay, we're trying to rewrite parts of the legacy app. Uh, it would be perfect if we could identify modules inside this legacy app that we could isolate in a way and then rewrite. So basically we're doing a total rewrite but on small chunks. So the main issue is managing to, out of this big spaghetti, 
make like small pieces of spaghetti and rewriting them, you know, one at a time. The pyramid is the logo of Theodore, so it's the uh, metaphor for perfect clean code, etc. So that's what the dream architecture would look like. That's usually what it uh, looks like. So basically a complete graph. And um, so how do you attack that? Well, if you manage to identify these blue rectangles, so you identify things that are functionally um, different, but they're all connected to each other, then the first step is to create the dream API. So what you would have liked to find. So you do like these really nice API classes, and then one at a time, you rewrite the connections between these different modules um, to use these dream APIs. And then you end up with this really nice architecture. And since everything is going through an API now, you can change the whole blue thing if it, if it follows the API interface, everything is working. This is actually not my invention. And this is called facade pattern. So this is the Wikipedia definition. It's basically when you create an interface that you put in front of a large body of code and that you try to use it. So a typical usage they say is if you want to reduce dependencies of outside code on the inner workings of a library. So exactly what we're trying to do. So how do you do that with Symfony 2? Um, so the new API would be a service. So you would create a service. Um, the way we do it is basically creating a bundle for every function module we identified in the legacy app and try to use the, and then when we're trying to use this module to go through the new service that we created. And once you're starting to use the services, then you're on the good way. So an example that we're uh, having all the time is um, Simple example, you're, tr you're trying to rewrite a Symfony 1 app using, I don't know, Propo, for example, an old one, and you're trying to rewrite to Symfony 2. So you're basically, you have these uh, peer classes, that are, like, huge thousand line classes that contain a lot of business logic. You don't want to rewrite them for the moment, but you just want to add a, 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 a nice API in front of them. So you create your new service, for example, this is for a log system, you create your post service, and basically when you do the get by ID um, <coughs> function, then you use the former method that you don't understand why it was called in a weird way. Um, and the, at least your, the new code you will build upon it is completely decoupled from the old code. And that is quite reassuring. <coughs> So, nice. Now the re the most the biggest problem and the hardest one. The problem is it's usually one of the it's not the one you can attack the, at last uh, at the end. But if your model is fine and the good thing about your legacy app is it's really badly written, but at least the model is good, then you're fine. If it's not, then you're usually in the in the bit of a problem because. Uh, um, Typical MySQL database is highly coupled, looks like that. So if you're trying to say, okay, let's isolate this part and rewrite it, it doesn't work because as you can see, it's connected to really every other class and table of the model. So that's why, um, that's what I call, um, to trying to decouple a relation database by definition is really hard. It's like attacking a giant monster. <laughs> and it looks really scary. So the way you would do that, and I mean the way most people actually do it in the end, is usually trying to sync two versions of data. So they make two databases, the legacy one and the new one. And, and then they rewrite it, the new, in a really more, much more beautiful way. 
and I try to sync them together using a so ETL tools. ETL means extract, transform, and load. So basically, when you're doing a migration script from a, an old data f uh, model to a new data model, it's called ETL. And um, that's the classical solution. So it's, of course, it's a, it, it can really create a lot of headaches because you will soon, if you don't, if you're not really careful, you will have like uh, data corruption. So, the first thing to do to avoid like horrible headaches is to actually write in only one of the two databases. And um, yeah, I'm gonna show you the architecture later. But now the interesting thing is I often, when I'm trying to um, fight for progressive rewrites, people tell me, no, in my case it's impossible. You're right, it looks good, but in my case it's not possible because my model is horrible. And it will be like way too much work to actually try to do a complicated migration system like you're suggesting we should do. Now, what I usually answer is, even if you're like aiming for total rewrites of the model, you will be developing on the new model for a long time. You should be able to test your new developments on real data, so you should actually be um, you should create migration scripts for the old data to the new model, and you should run them regularly to check that your new developments are actually working with the, um, with the current database. Because if you don't do that, then you put in production, you're sure that you will just destroy everything. So this means that you will, like the same strategy, even for total rewrite, is to script the migrations and run them every day, and maybe every, even every hour. So basically, well, the thing is, what I found interesting is that you look very much, when you do that, like what you could do if you were doing a progressive rewrite, which would be basically migrating the old model to the new one every, I don't know, five minutes, for example, if you can do that. And so, in a way, I'm trying to prove you that it's not harder to do a same total rewrite than doing a yeah, other rewrite. It's not much easier to do that than to uh, do a progressive rewrite. So, to come back to the uh, architecture, so the way you should do it is try to um, write only in one database. So for example, the new one, you only write in that one. So this one is writing in that one, this one is writing in that one. And then you've got your script that is run, I don't know, as often as you can. That is, whenever there's a new data here, brings it back to the old database. This way, basically, the legacy app, you don't have to touch it for all the reads, and usually when you look at code, there are many more selects than there are updates, deletes, and inserts. And you do have to somehow hook into the writes, so insert, update, and delete, and manage to somehow put them here. So typical, so that typically you would uh, be facing a MySQL uh, database on that side, um, that's an intuition I have, and I've already tried it. Uh, that is actually makes sense to try a non-relational database for the new one, to make it easier. Why? Um, well, because once again, we're facing the issue of uh, trying to decouple data, to rewrite parts of it. Basically, that's exactly what a non-relational database gives you out of the box. Like, it forces you not to... Um, yeah, to make all the, oh, ooh. <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, like a non-relation database forces you to, um, <laughs> and it's back. Uh, no, no, I'm confused. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it forces you to um, make collections that are independent from one another that you will be able to rewrite in the long term. And also the idea of using a document database like MongoDB is that you're much more agile. You will be able to change the, uh, the model as you code. And so in a way you're not doing the same mistake that you did before was like uh, the wrong MySQL uh, model. What you can use when you're using the Doctrine ODM uh, layer is you can actually use the preload event so that, um, so that you can actually change the, the transform the, uh, the data 
just when you load it. So that might be one strategy. So basically what would the strategy I'm suggesting right now is saying, okay, I find a, a really simple script that just dumps my MySQL data in the MongoDB data, and then every time I load the data, I look at it, is it like the new version, or is it the old one, or is the old version, okay, I'm migrating it to the new version. Sounds, uh, it sounds easier when I say than if you had to do it in uh, yourself, but that's a strategy. Uh, we actually tried it on a project, and it, yeah, it works. So, we've seen the seven steps to Enlightenment and Symphony 2. Uh, what does the future look like? Um, so all the um, um, open source bundles I show you, basically two, uh, they're part of an R&D project that we started at Theodore in 2012. And the idea was really to um, try to solve all the issues that makes app rewriting uh, hard and to make it agile again. And our dream, because we, we're trying to do that on an industrial level, so the idea is not to make it, not to make like custom solutions every time, but really to have a, a generic solution that would enable us to work on a legacy app without actually touching the legacy code, that would be like perfect. And just by wrapping all our bundles around it. And yeah, we've done quite some things already in that direction. So this is just to show you parts of the guys that are been working in that. Yeah, no girls, I'm sorry. It's not really good, Never mind. Um, I hope I convince you that they have really nice and smart faces. So you can <laughs> trust them. So um, right now we're working on six progressive rewrites of huge applications to Symphony 2, so we're really gathering experience. And what we're also doing is like uh, trying to bundle all the technical solutions we end up with in bundles and in the project that we call Theodore Evolution. And yeah, we've already started open sourcing some. So the session bundle, it's interesting, there, there have already been two contributions, I think, outside of Teodo. It's been open source for one month, two months. And the Drupal bundle, which is open source since yesterday, which shows how you can actually plug into the routing. It's more a proof of concept, but it's quite interesting. <clears throat> so what is next? Um, on our side, I would really like to, um, to open source a demonstration of how you can actually plug these bundles on the Zen Framework 1. So that you, because we, we end up seeing a lot of Zen Framework 1 projects right now, and that people want to migrate to Symfony 2, so I want to open source that to show that it's not that hard, actually. Um, the next bundle also I would really be happy, and the, the team is working on that to open source, is the uh, authentication sharing between a Symfony 1 app and a Symfony 2 app because we worked on that. We found a solution to really share all the permissions between the Symfony 1 SFGuard user plugin and the Symfony 2 authentication system. And that's on our roadmap for open source. And the work in progress because right now I'm not sure I really reassured you on the uh, model migration, even though I'm quite convinced it's a good way to go is to yeah, create a really uh, a proof of concept of real-time synchronization between a MySQL database and a, and a MongoDB database and show that it's actually not that hard. So that's the next step. And that's it for the moment. So thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, now is the time. Yes. If the legacy app is not using an RM, um, so it can be a good news and it can be a bad news. So, I mean, it doesn't change much actually to what I said. It basically changes. Um, you wouldn't be able to hook into the old RM, but it's. Most of the cases, you don't want to do it anyway. And if the model's good, then at least you can just, you know, use, for example, if you were planning to use Doctrine 2, you dump, you create the schema, the schema, sorry, 
out of the uh, existing database, and then you directly work on that new, on those new classes to create a new RM layer. Now, if the model is really bad, then you're stuck with the same problem you had in the seventh part. So yeah, it doesn't change much actually. Would we have migrated Um, uh, so let me rephrase that. So in the routing, if there's an index file, I'm not sure it's an issue because basically, if there's an index file, you know, you mean in the way it's already done in Symfony 2, so there's an app.php file. So basically, the, um, when, you're, when, yeah, when the application is working that way, it basically means that, they're, that it's using rewrite to like direct whatever routes you have to this file. And that's done on the server layer, so be it in, be it in the Dutch HTXS file or somewhere else. Um, and that's basically back to the three strategies. Well, that's gonna take time. Um, yeah, so basically either you're using the strategy one and basically you're using two different V hosts one with the Symphony 2 typical rewrite, one with the legacy run, or you are rewriting everything to Symphony 2, and then in your Symphony 2 control, you would be basically copy-pasting the content of the index.php file of your legacy app. And in the third case, so this was actually uh, tried by us on a big project, it worked quite well. And in the third case, if you don't want to copy paste the uh, content of the index.php file, and it, it's actually m more complicated than just copy pasting. So the workaround that is easy is dumping the, uh, the Symfony 2 routing in the Apache file before the legacy rewrite. In that, in that case, you don't have to work on the issues. The issues of copy pasting the index.php file here is basically you're not on the um, how do you call that in English? The global, but you're not global here. So if your index.php file is relying on defining globals, then it's a little more subtle. You have to try to dump all the variables and try to insert them in the global scope. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. And it's doable, but it's a bit, a bit more complicated. Okay, so I guess that's it, and it's exactly one hour. Well, we've been punctual. Thank you very much.